Great. Thank you very much, Alan. Appreciate it, and thank you all for coming here today. Um, one of the things that uh, makes me realize that we have arrived is our lawyers say we, we can't just have one page of disclaimers. We actually have to have two pages of disclaimers. Basically says we're not going to lie, cheat, or steal, and you shouldn't use any information I give you today to lie, cheat, or steal. Ianthus has a very, uh, a very simple premise. Uh, we provide investors with diversified exposure uh, to best-in-class licensed cannabis operators across the United States. Very straightforward. That does beg the question, however, why would an investor want that exposure? This is a $50 billion market. It's a black market moving from black to white. Uh, we offer investors diversified uh, operations. We are across five markets, soon to be six markets. We, uh, we give investors a two-pronged growth strategy. That means we operate both in greenfield markets like in Massachusetts and New York, as well as existing markets like in Vermont or New Mexico. And as states put in uh, a good regulatory scheme in place like California, we'll be in states like California, Oregon, Washington, and the like. Uh, it's a differentiated investment thesis. Alan touched on it. There's only a handful of public companies that allow investors to participate in what I call the cash register, the actual sale of cannabis. And you can count them on one hand in the United States, many more in Canada, but it's a very, very uh, differentiated investment piece with a limited number of ways to play. And then we have a management team, and this is the real key differentiator within cannabis today. You have to pick a good team. We think we have a great team that would work in almost in any industry, but within cannabis, uh, we think we uh, really do stand out. Uh, the market opportunity is quite unique. I've spent most of my career in entrepreneurial endeavors, and one of the things you always have to prove is who's going to buy my widget, who's going to sign up for my service. Within cannabis, that's already proven. You've got this $50 billion market, and I do think it's actually bigger than that. The $50 billion market is actually just a black market opportunity. It doesn't include people who used to purchase cannabis who would come back into the market if we're illegal. It doesn't include uh, new users of cannabis who've never actually tried it before. I think once you have full legalization in the United States, you're going to see the cannabis market look more like the tobacco or beer uh, market. So that $50 billion actually has an implicit growth beyond the growth of the economy. Currently, you've got a 6 or $7 billion legal market. And this is a very unique component. So you've got a $50 billion reservoir of annual sales. Someone opened up a sluice gate, and you've got 6 or $7 billion of revenue flowing down this river, and that's growing 25 to 30 percent a year. Interestingly, the question isn't, are people going to buy cannabis? The question is, who's going to benefit from that sale? The state governments have been very nice. They've handed out licenses, and they've put them on a website. So we can find our partners by going to those websites and then partnering with people who already have a license to participate in that growth. In the United States, it's a very state-driven legalization. You've got legalization across 29 states from a full medical perspective now. You've got legalization for full adult use in eight states. And if you include all the high CBD programs that exist in the United States, fully 93% of Americans have access to some form of cannabis. This is something that's not going to go back the other direction. And clearly, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, anyone who's going to spend time, money, treasure, in the industry, you should have the thesis this will become a regular way industry. You have to move one direction or another. And if you think it's going to be a regular way industry, um, it's, uh, it's probably something that uh, is going to be wealth creating and a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the federal government has actually stood on the sidelines to some extent. They haven't uh, uh, legalized this. They haven't decriminalized it. It is against the law. They have given some guidance. The Cole Memo. Uh, instructs the Justice Department to not uh, spend any time or effort in states that have a regulatory scheme in place. Uh, Rohrbacher Farr uh, went a little bit further and said, we're going to defund any federal activity in a state that has a good scheme in place. Um, the other uh, component that I find fairly unique within cannabis is that you do have wide bipartisan congressional support. So both uh, red states, blue states, Republicans, Democrats, it seems in this day and age it's really the only issue that people can agree on. I about fell off my chair a couple of weeks ago when Senator Orrin Hatch, uh, sort of, you know, the, the senior senator from Utah, came out and said he was supportive of medical cannabis. You, know, you could combine him with some of the uh, guys like Cory Booker. You know, it's almost you take that circle of politics and they're you know, one so far to the right, one so far to the left, they kind of meet, and where they meet is in cannabis. 
Uh, but this, this federal illegality combined with the uh, legality at the state level has led to a very interesting situation. Uh, clearly, there's been a lot written and a lot of people discuss the lack of capital from that happening, right? Because you're illegal at the federal basis. Uh, you can't go to Citibank and get a prime plus two loan to build out your greenhouse. You're not going to pick up the phone and call Goldman Sachs to take you public. You're not going to have KKR show up and do a management buyout for you. Um, but because uh, the capital stayed on the sideline, there's an actual more subtle but I think more important point. The usual followers of capital, the usual camp followers who would follow the capital into optical switching or the next hot spot within technology, uh, aren't available either. So you don't have your top line tax and accounting. You don't have your top line lawyers. You don't have lobbying expertise, regulatory expertise. So you have this situation where a U.S. cannabis entrepreneur has been given a license to have an oligopoly to sell cannabis and yet has no access to capital and no access to the usual advisors to help them build out a great company. And this has actually created the opportunity for Ianthus. Uh, we combine operational expertise across five states, so cultivation, processing, dispensaries, but we also offer expertise across multiple disciplines. Cannabis expertise, that's just the table stakes. If you're not good at cannabis, you're not going to be in business. You have to be able to grow and manufacture and put on the shelf a great product. But all your competition is going to be able to do that. The thing that's interesting within cannabis is sort of the boring parts of any other business actually allow you to differentiate and be an incredible operator within cannabis. So the ability to have operational expertise that you've poured in from other industries, simple things like managing your balance sheet in a cost-effective manner with a view towards what your capital needs are over time, uh, regulatory expertise, really understanding what's going on at a state level and how that might impact you from a compliance or operational perspective, the ability to acquire real estate in a timely fashion and structure your leases in a manner so that you don't come into cash flow issues down the road. Government relations, you have an oligopoly. You better draw a circle around that, dig a moat, put up a fence, understand what the local state house is doing. And if you don't, you may find yourself without a license at some point. You need to pay attention to those things. And then one of the things that we bring to the table that no other Canadian public company can is we bring a liquid security for acquisitions. We purposely remained a U.S. tax filer when we list the United States. Sort of like a reverse inversion. Most people move outside the United States to avoid tax. We stayed within the United States and still pay tax. What does that mean? We have Canadian shares, but we can use them in a tax-free reorganization. When we acquire someone in New York, when we acquire someone in Florida, the seller of that asset rolls over their basis. We're the only company that has proactively done that and gives investors that opportunity. That gives us a huge competitive advantage when we sit down to talk about acquisitions state by state. None of this can really happen unless you actually have an excellent team. The only long-term difference anything that any company has is its team. IP can be copied. Processes can be learned. The only thing you have is a team. And we've put together an unbelievable team for really pretty much any industry, but within cannabis, we think it's unprecedented. From a finance and capital market perspective, the ability to raise money, structure balance sheet, and think cogently about what your growth strategy should, should be. Myself and our CFO, uh, Julius Kalsevich, have raised over $50 billion of announced transactions north and south of the border. I'm based in New York. My career is from Wall Street. Julius is based up in Toronto. His career is on Bay Street. Uh, from an operational perspective, we combine both the cannabis side. Uh, Jamie Lewis is one of the preeminent uh, operators within the industry. She was a founder of a large vertically integrated Colorado operation. Prior to that, she grew uh, in California. She now heads up our operations in Massachusetts. Uh, the most recent partner we've added to the business, uh, Carlos Pereira, uh, he and I have known each other 25 years. I went to Wall Street, he went into manufacturing operations. He was director of manufacturing at Intel for eight years. He ran their most successful fab, the gold standard of manufacturing. He was the gold standard at the gold standard. Highest margins, highest yields, represented 20% of their free cash flow on a global basis. The most important thing, about Carlos, though, is within cannabis, easy to find guys like me, easy to find a bud tender. Any company runs on competent middle management. When Carlos was at Intel, he hired 120 people every month for three years straight and had the lowest turnover of any general manager at Intel. From a regulatory and government, uh, government affairs perspective, my co-founder 
and uh, partner Randy Maslow. Uh, spent his entire career in regulatory, what I would call gray areas. He's one of the first guys in online travel, one of the first guys in alternative telephony, is one of the founders of Exo Communications, which was bought for $4 billion, uh, and a founder of IGE, which was the largest virtual currency trading company in the world, uh, of some note, because it was bought by Steve Bannon, who then ran it into the ground, which I find endlessly fascinating that my partner's frenemies with Steve Bannon. <laughs> uh, Dr. Boxer, my... Um, a uh, close personal friend sits on our board. Uh, he was a finalist for Surgeon General twice, an advisor to Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, uh, and both Bushes. He's been on Air Force One, uh, WHO representative for the U.S. government, uh, many uh, NIH committees. Uh, and when he sits down and needs to work the ropes from a regulatory or educational perspective in Washington, D.C., or at a local basis, no one can really um, hold a candle to him. And then you need to make things come up out of the ground. Uh, John Henderson, who's our chief development officer, lives in Boston. He's the primary reason we have one of the only dispensaries in the city of Boston. Uh, he ran a construction services company. I think it was the second largest in New England uh, for years. He's built out millions of square feet of high tech and health care. Um, properties. Uh, we're currently operating in five states pro forma for our acquisition of New York. Uh, we are in Massachusetts, Vermont, New Mexico, Colorado, and New York. I'd like to talk a little bit about New York. This fits squarely in the uh, strike zone of what we look for. New York is a state of 20 million residents, and there's only 10 licenses. If this was 1933, and someone said to you, I'm going to give you one of the 10 licenses to sell alcohol in New York, you'd probably pay $18 million for that in 1933 dollars. We're spending $18 million in 2017 dollars. You get a vertically integrated license, allows you to control the margin of the entire supply chain. There's a wide range actually required secondary products which are much higher and home delivery uh, is allowed. Uh, the company that we're buying is called Sativa. Uh, it's an $18 million acquisition. 80% uh, of that will be in stock on that uh, aforementioned uh, tax-free reorg and 20% of that will be paid in cash. We think it will be very accretive to shareholders on a forward multiple basis. This will be about two times 2019 estimated uh, cash flow. Um, the way the license process works in New York is the uh, state has uh, allocated four counties to each license holder. Two of the four counties we've been allocated are in the five boroughs of New York. One is Brooklyn. We're going to be one of two dispensaries in the city of Brooklyn. Uh, that's a city of 2.6 million people. That's pretty interesting. I'll tell you another component that's exceptionally interesting. Kim Volman, who is the CEO of Sativa, uh, actually is a, a well-known entrepreneur in the medical community in his own right. He built a $50 million compounding pharmacy business, guess where, in Brooklyn. He has a relationship with 800 to 900 physicians. For those of you who don't know what compounding pharmacy is, a physician will say, oh, my patient, you know, I want to use this branded drug, but it's not quite right, or maybe not the right price, there's some side effects, calls up the pharmacist and make a custom drug for the ailment of that physician. That sounds a lot like a custom drug for medical cannabis. His specialty, pain management, subspecialty, opiate addiction. If he could do a $50 million business in a competitive business like compounding pharmacy in the city of Brooklyn, I can't wait to see what this guy does with one of two licenses in the city. And pickup and delivery is allowed. Uh, the other borough that we've been given is uh, Staten Island. Staten Island is a borough of 500,000 people. We have the only location on the island. Uh, we're located right next to a Target store, probably you know, 500 parking spaces. Interestingly, uh, Sativa's chief medical officer, a fellow named Dr. Jack D'Angelo, is currently the number one certifying physician for cannabis in the state. Going forward, those certifications will be filled uh, at Sativa. We think this store will be a tremendous success. Uh, another market that we're in on the East Coast, Massachusetts, we think this is a spectacular market. You've got 7 million uh, residents. Uh, you've got 13 million people who live within a two to three mile or two to three hour drive of Boston. Why would I put that point up there? Well, Massachusetts will be a full rec state sometime in 2018. While I would never uh, say that anyone should be in the business of diverting product across state lines because it is in violation of the coal memo. This will be the first major state on the East Coast full wreck. If you're 21 years old, show your driver's license, you can buy cannabis. There are tens of 20s of 30s of millions of people who live on the East Coast, including 200,000 students who don't live in, in Massachusetts who go to school there. 
Uh, we really do like the program in Massachusetts, even though there's a theoretically uncapped number of licenses for, for the state. They've made it exceptionally hard to locate those licenses. The program's been open three years. There's 12 stores open. Each one of those 12 stores, near as we can tell from back channel, is doing over a million dollars a month right now. The medical program allows flour, edibles, other extracts. There's a long list of indications, and it's a fairly straightforward process to get your card, and you go full rec next year. Uh, we've been awarded three licenses by the state, publicly announced at one location. We're branded under Mayflower Medicinals. We have cultivation and processing, and we're located, uh, our one store that we've publicly announced is located in the city of Boston. Only three stores have been approved in the city. That's a city of close to 700,000 people with 200,000 students. We're on Harvard Avenue, equidistant between five major universities. We can do pickup and delivery. It's going to be a spectacular market for us. Um, looking forward, from a New York perspective, we're breaking ground on cultivation in, in the fourth quarter. We should close the acquisition of Sativa in the fourth quarter in a dispensary open in 2018. Those of you who are quick with math might say, how can you start cultivation in the fourth quarter and be selling something in the first quarter? Uh, wholesale is allowed in New York, and we're in discussions with several of the extant uh, growers in the state right now. Hopefully, if we can come to some accommodation, we'll be revenue positive uh, in January of 2018. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, we should be popping seeds within the next month. Uh, we're finishing out the uh, construction of our Boston dispensary. We should be announcing the location of our second sometime later this quarter. And we should have the Boston dispensary open sometime in the first quarter uh, or early in second quarter for uh, generating sales. Uh, the most recent market that we've been interested in is Florida. Um, many of you may have seen the uh, credit facility that we announced a couple of weeks ago or may have seen the press release that came out this morning about a small stock investment in a company called Grow Healthy. Those are interesting but small financial bets. Um, the m more exciting part of the press release is what I call the exclusive dealing period. We have to the end of this year to actually negotiate and announce something that would be of more interest than a small minority stake uh, in a license holder in the state. But again, this, this is a state that fits squarely in the strike zone of what we look for. 20 million residents, uh, half the population is over the age of 40, which is the fastest growing segment of cannabis use in the United States. Wide variety of marijuana products allowed. Currently only 12 licenses, probably be 17 in the next several months. Importantly, the original seven have a huge head start versus anybody else. If you look at the, uh, the company Grow Healthy, uh, they already have a cultivation center, 200,000 square feet indoor, 10,000 square feet of canopy right now, several million dollars of inventory. Uh, they will start selling on a delivery basis in November. And if you look out into January, uh, some of the money that they've borrowed from us is actually being used for the build out of the first of two of 25 dispensaries they're allowed to build. Um, the first one is in West Palm Beach. This is a city of close to three, or an area that has a catchment of about 300,000 uh, people. The nearest competitor is nine miles away. Uh, the second dispensary location, they're using some of the funds that we've given to begin construction this month, is in Tampa. Again, close to 200,000 people within the catchment area of that dispensary, and the nearest competitor is 10 miles away. Tremendous head start into the market uh, in Florida. If we were to um, uh, affect the acquisition of Sativa and Grow Healthy, it would give us an addressable market, a population base of 48 million people. The near-term forecast for the medical sales only in those markets is over a billion dollars. If you thought about what might happen if Florida or New York went full rec sometime in the next two to three years, that would imply that we have a footprint that gives us access to close to $8 billion of revenue opportunity. One of the things I get a question on is, well, geez, you got Massachusetts, you have New York, you have Florida. These are great markets, but they're greenfield. How can we tell what your progress looks like or, God, you know, what, what should you be worth? How do you value that? This is something that um, from my past career as a banker back in the 90s, we had to deal with all the time. So when I was a telecom banker, you had this strange business called cellular, and people were granted licenses. And they were valued, believe it or not, on pops, short for population. So someone said, I've got, a, I've got 5 million pops. I've got 10 million pops. And someone would say, 
that's great. That's worth $180, and they value it on a shorthand basis because each individual in an oligopoly situation would generate a certain amount of revenue at a certain margin, and that was the shorthand way you thought about it. Cable was the same way. Cable uh, operators were given an oligopoly, one of one, two, three, four licenses in a market. What was that worth? Subs, short for subscribers. Before they had cash flow, before they had earnings, they had subs. I've got 400,000 subs. Great, those are worth $2,000 a piece. Bang, there comes a valuation. The analog that I see in the U.S. market are what I'd call oligopoly cash registers, a very well-licensed, located dispensary. And it doesn't matter if you're in a highly competitive market or a restricted market. If you have a good location and a license and it's defensible, you're going to do 10 to $15 million of revenue at one of those cash registers. An eight-minute cab ride from here is a dispensary in the city of Oakland, which is the largest grossing dispensary in the United States. And this is a highly competitive market. If you're well-located, good brand and defensible, you'll generate a lot of revenue. Um, so if you were to know of a company that had dispensaries in New York, Massachusetts, Colorado, Vermont, and let's say the state of Florida, and that company had 30 well-located dispensaries across those oligopoly markets and was to generate $10 million of revenue per dispensary, you would have a company in the next 24 months that would have a run rate of close to $300 million of revenue. And that's if they did their pro rata share. So let's compare this to other investment opportunities that might exist in the market today. The Canadian market is two to three years ahead of the U.S. markets from an investment thesis and capital markets and stock perspective. The Canadian market has 36 million um, people. Uh, the East Coast footprint for Ianthus on a pro forma basis would be close to 48 million people. Our addressable market on a customer basis is a third larger. The industry pundits have forecast a near-term rec and medical market for Canada of about six billion Canadian dollars. The same, uh, using the same math would be close to 10 billion Canadian dollars in the market that we get to play, and that's almost two-thirds as large as the Canadian market. In Canada, this chart's a little out of date, it says 52 competitors, probably 58 licensed competitors in Canada. Across our markets, if you weight the licenses times the population, we have 13 competitors, 74% fewer competitors. If you take the competitors and look at just the pro rata share of revenue across those competitors, it's about 100 million Canadian per competitor in Canada. It's close to 700 million per competitor in the U.S. Six to seven times more upside opportunity per competitor in the footprint that we're going to be competing in. In Canada, you'd have the opportunity as, a, as an investor to have your pick of 22. I think it's 25 public companies right now. If you wanted to take advantage of a 48 million addressable market, in the United States, there's one public company that gives you as an investor the opportunity to play. Our market cap, or the average Canadian market cap across those public companies now is north of $300 million Canadian. Our market cap is about $100 million. We trade at a significant discount, yet we think we have much more upside and many few competitors. Um, in conclusion, it's, uh, we offer investors an exposure to a very large market opportunity and there's just a handful of companies that do so. We offer investors diversified uh, operations across multiple states. Uh, Two-pronged growth strategy, greenfield and existing operations, um, only a handful of ways to play, and we think we have the best management team in the market to make all of that happen. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll start it off real quickly. Okay. I'm gonna give you a hard one first, and you can... <laughs> I can't even give it to anybody. We're kind of in a public forum. Maybe you can't answer, but <clears throat> you had a deal in New York that you replaced. Ooh, the, the switching roommates. Yeah, can you uh, elaborate on that or no? Oh, sure. Um, uh, Alan is referring to we had a deal with a company called Valley Agriceutical. A uh, little backdrop. So New York originally uh, had a uh, process. I think there was 48 applicants, and they awarded five licenses. And we were very close with Valley Agriceutical. We actually backed them on a contingent basis in their first license application. They didn't get one. So we'd known them for uh, two or three years. Um, the state then uh, came back uh, earlier this year and said, hey, we're going to award five new licenses. It didn't get a lot of press at the time, but that's because Valley Agriceutical had sued 
on some technicality stuff. The state didn't want to deal with it, so they just settled and said, hey, we'll give out five new licenses. We said, that's great. We've known these guys a long time. We're very friendly with them. We entered into a binding term sheet, supposed to be a friendly deal. We gave it our best efforts for two months. I mean, we had a binding term sheet everything been agreed to. Uh, sometimes like-minded parties can't agree. Um, we struggled with that for two months. Uh, then on a Friday, we just made the determination we were never going to get to a close. As a public company, we have uh, um, a responsibility to announce that that's our view. Um, so we knew that Monday morning we'd have to announce one way or another that we weren't going to actually move for a close with Valley Agriceutical. So fortunately, because we are headquartered in New York and we know all the players, um, we had a board meeting Saturday morning. Uh, that afternoon, I called around to the uh, other four uh, potential uh, new license holders uh, and said, I haven't seen any announced deals. Are you interested in doing something? We'd actually had term sheets in front of most of them at the time, so we already had pre-negotiated term sheets. We just picked the Valley Ag guys. And fortunately, the Sativa guy said, yeah, well, it might be of interest. Uh, they had a quick board meeting. It's a small board. Um, the only three guys were friends. So they had a board meeting that night. And then we negotiated the terms of the deal that Sunday and then announced everything on Monday morning. Well, yeah, and, 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 you're, and, this, and this gets to my, the, the sort of what I said. It's sort of, I can't think of another team within cannabis that would be able to, one, make the decision, the prudent decision, the right decision from a public disclosure perspective to say, we have taken this far enough and then have the ability and management chops to be able to reach out and then negotiate a deal and then be able to announce that in a cogent fashion on Monday morning and protect your existing shareholders from having your stock plummet and give a second alternative. We actually, you know, I think ended up with a, uh, a very good team and a very good asset. And that's what you get. And that's why I said, you know, everything else can be copied, but this is a $50 billion opportunity. You're going to see a lot of twists and turns. You want to make sure you back a team that when things twist and turn, they're going to figure out how to make money for you. And that, I think that's sort of exhibit one for that. Well, thanks for taking the talk. No, it's well, my play. pleasure. Yes, sir. I've been very impressive with what you folks have done so far. Oh, thank you. The, um, uh, have you given guidance for gross revenue for next year? Uh, well, we, we're, we're, there's three companies that write research on us, uh, Canaccord, Beacon, and, and uh, Coremark up in Canada. And you know, there's sort of a range of like 25 to $35 million in revenue. And we're comfortable with that. I mean, here's how I look at it. Um, the near-term revenue is going to have a lot of choppiness, right? Like Boston, you know, if you start selling in March versus April, well, that's a big hit when I mean, you got one year. You know, if we can do wholesale in New York in January, that's a lot different than selling our own product in August. So the near-term piece can be very volatile. I will say, <laughs> and my lawyer will smack me in the back of the head, I will say, the 2019 forecasts are probably going to be low. I mean, I just look at the opportunity that we have, and regardless of when something open or it gets going or anything in 2018, they'll all be open by 2019, and we'll be generating revenue, and it'll look like a regular company. I think one of the things that held, has held our stock back is precisely that point. We're almost like a collection of options. Hey, we've got stuff in Massachusetts. We've got an ability to close a deal in New York. We have an ability to close a deal in Florida, but we haven't closed them. We haven't opened stores. We haven't shown the revenue. Uh, I think a year from now, it's going to look a lot different. You're going to show um, store openings, same store growth, margins, your ability to uh, actually compare and contrast across all of those markets. It's preseason. You're trying to pick the Super Bowl winner on <laughs> Well, I know who the winner is going to be. And another question. You guys have been obviously very aggressive on the greenfield part of your business model, mm -hmm. taking a long game. And you know, real investors should appreciate that. But at the same time, what, what are the obstacles to filling in with Well, I, I thought the tough question you're going to ask, I mean, the, the, the Sativa Valley Ag one is interesting, but the tougher one is, hey, didn't you guys like buy something in Colorado and announce you're going to do something really big in there? Well, that's tough to do. <laughs> well, exactly. I, we think that there's a tremendous opportunity, especially though, and we, this is why we proactively structured ourselves this way, to use our stock on a, uh, a 368 ability to tax defer. We think markets like Colorado, Washington, Oregon, California, when the state regs are in place, Michigan, when the state regs are in place, some of these more mature markets offer a real opportunity for the classic roll-up. But typically, the way those roll-ups have worked from a public-private perspective, the private multiples are percentages different from the public multiples. In this case, the public and private discrepancy are like, you know, 
like multiple, multiple, multiples. There's not percentages. So the ability to go into a Colorado and say, where you've got 80% mom and pop stores and build a platform where you can shut down growth, shut down MIPS, consolidate back office and buy things for one or one and a half times revenue. God forbid it trades at, you know, kind of the Canadian multiples of 10 to 15 times revenue. Even if you're only trading at like an InBev multiple of two and a half times, that opportunity is tremendous. The MPV generation of being able to use your stock to roll up a Colorado, an Oregon, a Washington, a, a California, and you don't have to be first to market. People ask me all the time, are you going to be in California? I say, we are going to be in California, but I'm not going to be in it now before the state regs are there. I'm not going to be in it in January. Let people beat up themselves up. Find out who's going to have 12 cash-flowing storefronts and then use your stock. People are still going to need capital. They're still going to need a mark-to-market. And they're still going to need help in sort of how you think through those growth aspects of your business. And you had another question, sir. Uh, if, uh, profitability, when do you see? Uh, I mean, we're pro and it doesn't show through in our financials, but you know, Vermont's profitable now, New Mexico's profitable, Colorado's profitable. Um, typically, we'll see free cash generation. You put a shovel in the ground, you know, 12 to 16 months after this. So I would expect to see. Uh, Massachusetts profitable, you know, 12 months from now. I'd expect to see New York profitable 12 to 16 months, same in Florida. And it's, you know, you, it's like any sort of CapEx type business. You're going to dig a hole and then you're going to dig your way out of it once you get the revenue. So you're trading at four times, multi, uh, four times your uh, revenue. Uh, well, I wish I would. We're trading about three, but <laughs> hopefully after you buy a little stock, it'll be four. <laughs> You had a question? Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you were talking just about the price of sales multiples mm -hmm. one to one and a half times. I, I don't know, were you, were you talking about that just, just generally? Or that's just, that's just an example of what you're seeing. That's what we see in the private market. Okay. Like if we, if we um, you know, if we were going to buy something in Colorado, buy something in Oregon, buy something in Washington, you know, kind of the, the weird rule of thumb. Um, and it's a little bit strange because you got this whole 280 thing, but the typical rule of thumb is kind of one to one and a half times revenue plus the value of unencumbered real estate. You sort of back through all that stuff, and you know it implies kind of a, a four-ish times, four and a half times EBITDA multiple because your effective tax rate with 280E is going to be 50 to 60 percent. You're kind of a 10 times net earnings number, but you know the you know the S and P trades at 15 times earnings, so. Uh, you know, you, you really have this dearth of capital, which has caused a depression in asset values in the United States. And, uh, you know, I don't know when that reverses itself, right? You've, you, you do have federal illegality, you have this wacky tax position, um, you've got an inability to use leverage. So there's reasons why they trade at those levels. All those things will peel off. So, you know, I, I look at it and I say, even if we can't operate ourselves out of a paper bag, collecting assets, almost like you know, digging up gold coins, they're going to accrete in value. At some point, the federal prohibition goes away. At some point, 280E you know, goes away. I mean, that's a 40 to 50 percent bump in your free cash flow right there. At some point, Citibank will give you that prime plus two loan. You can start to leverage things and get a better equity return. So even if we're just mumbling and bumbling operators, which I don't think we will. I ran an operating company. My COO, <laughs> the guy from Intel, my other partner you know, was at Exo Communications. I think we can operate. Um, you're still going to get asset accretion. I just get the sense that you know when you're issuing stock to certain individuals who run, run these businesses, mm -hmm. it might be hard for them to grasp you know, the opportunity that exists within the stock and they want cash. So. There's some want cash. We'll give them cash if they do. And, and in that situation where you have to come up with the cash, do you tap public equity markets to... Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm a, as my background is healthcare and banking. Um, I ran a healthcare company and I was a banker for years. Um, I, I, the only reason we're public is because that's where the money was. Right? I mean, my partner and I looked around and we said, there's a tremendous opportunity within cannabis. Now, originally, we thought we'd just raise a bunch of private capital. In my healthcare company, I spent a year and a half with my business plan, went to the Rolodex and raised $800 million of private capital. We tried to do the same thing in cannabis, same Rolodex, same guy. I thought a much better business plan. I raised $9 million. So, you know, the ability to tap into that private market just didn't exist. Then we stumbled across the Canadian public markets, really the only capital market anywhere in the world, public or private, that has shown a willingness to give entrepreneurs capital. 
And now it's been Canadian entrepreneurs and Canadian investors, but our supposition was we could structure something where we could educate the Canadian investor on the U.S. opportunity. And that, that was sort of the genesis of being public. But I, I don't really care if I raise public money. As a matter of fact, again, my lawyer would smack me. I was just in recent discussions about doing a very, actually still in discussions about, you know, what a nice private place it might look like. Because there's a lot of private guys who love the idea that we're public because they can get a sense of where the value is, so it makes it easier to price the security. But you get a lot more with some of these private guys. You get a strategic advantage, right? They've got deeper capital, or they may have other holdings that you can do some strategic things with. They're you know, across multiple borders. I was on a discussion this morning with a placement agent out of Luxembourg who has money out of the Middle East, wants to do you know, a structured debt financing against our real estate piece. I've had the exact same discussions in New York and the exact same discussions in Melbourne. So that's when I say, again, you know, pick the team. That's, that's what I do. I was a banker, and I, you find pools of capital and you put it together with projects. So we, we will always look for the lowest cost capital we can from a shareholder perspective. And one of the interesting dynamics I've seen in the last six or seven months is a willingness of sort of more regular, I wouldn't call it regular way, but more structured debt financing secured by real estate, lease holdings, tenant improvements, things like that. The cost of capital around that, because you probably have to use some warrants, is going to be kind of, you know, mid-teens. That's a hell of a lot lower in our cost of equity. So if we can lay, start to layer some of that in, and I'd be shocked if we didn't over the next six months, you know, that's going to supercharge the equity returns as well. It's kind of a long answer to your question, but I do. that's basically what I think about every day. Oh, I appreciate that. Just sorry, one, one last follow-up. Sure. Think about those creative options that you have mm -hmm. and the ability to, like you said, kind of debt finance some of the, the real estate. Mm -hmm. um, is there, if you, if you take it to its next derivative, is there a potential to, to split the real estate holding? Yeah. <laughs> the options? Yeah. And then, because clearly you're going to get a, a, well, not clearly, but presumably you'll get a better valuation mm -hmm. of the real estate piece of it than you're currently getting. Oh, absolutely. No, and that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to see that happen, you know, in the next 12 months, but I think if you looked out over a longer period of time, that makes all the sense in the world. I mean, that's what Marriott did, right? You got real estate and you got brand. And th th again, it comes back to this will be a regular way industry. Every model any of you have ever seen in any industry anywhere in the United States will happen in cannabis. They just don't exist today. Right now, the only thing that exists is I sell stuff for cash and I have no access to money. <laughs> it will, I mean, you will have all the usual corporate finance tools at your disposal. You'll have all the franchise piece, the real estate finance companies, the brand companies, the disaggregation of grow. It will all happen. It just hasn't happened yet. But that's what I love about the business. You know, I, I collect two things. I collect licenses to sell, because I think ringing the cash register is easy to diligence. And I collect great people. That's what will make you a lot of money. And our business model has changed, and it will continue to evolve as we see how the opportunities evolve. Hey, Ali, I have a question. Now. Yes. So you guys are obviously working a bunch of silos. That mm -hmm. you know, from the outside, that's what it looks like. But internally, besides things like shared services, are there any other synergies in, in your business model between? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, and. and I don't want to oversell it too much because there's sort of three phases to this. The first is get a license. The second is finance that license. And the third is then opt optimize the operational piece. And we just – one of the reasons Carlos came on board is that, that third piece. But, uh, you know, just because we may have a brand that says Sativa in New York and Mayflower in Massachusetts and um, Grow Healthy in Florida – a customer who walks in any of those stores is going to say, well, if they've walked into like all three and say, this looks kind of very familiar, right? So your store design, your marketing, your collateral, your layout is all going to look the same. Your finance and compliance pieces, you know, that reports right up to Toronto. So like your ERP system, POS, your controller, the controller doesn't even report to the local. It reports up. HR, any of those typical back office things, you know, all you know, we're, th those are already in place. The operational piece is a little more interesting. And you know, one, one of the things in cannabis I find fascinating, there's not like a big reported track record. Like if this was a regular industry, you, you know, everyone would say, hey, that's what it costs to grow a gram of corn. That's what it costs to grow a pound of potatoes. And you could compare in cannabis. I mean, I met with guys in Colorado. They're doing $100,000 per employee. I met with people in Oregon. They're doing $500,000 per employee. 
I, I never saw that in any other industry. I mean, they're like the same exact business. It just happens to be two different people came about it from two different ways. So the opportunity we have is we partner or acquire is to then benchmark. Like if we acquired that operator in, in Oregon and they're doing 500 grand per employee, I guess I'm going to take a lot of those best practices, throw them through the Carlos Intel process machine, and then replicate that. And we have a call every week where the CEOs of each division, you know, we measure and manage. they got their KPIs, their key performance indicators, and what are you doing? Take those best practices. Are we doing that today? No. I mean, I mean, we, we, we do that process today, but we, we haven't said, hey, let's take the growing piece from New Mexico and replicate it here. A lot of times you can't even do that. New Mexico has a plant count limit, so people grow these big Christmas trees, and in other states, you, know, you can grow a big canopy in Colorado, so it's kind of hard to compare them, but you can't compare the cost. Then you say, okay, why is a guy in New Mexico going at a buck 41 a gram and a guy in Colorado is at 210? Maybe he should grow big Christmas trees, you know? So, you know, that, that's sort of early days. And when you're in an oligopoly situation where you can sell something for 10 bucks a gram and, you know, your cost is two bucks a gram, there's a lot of margin in between. But, you know, the optimization is sort of stage three. Did that answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'll meet you right outside. I'm, I'm here all day. It's what I do, answer questions. I love it. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>